All right, so what we want to do today is kind of cap off a series that I've been wanting to do for several years now, but it's just the how to happen, or how do we do it, or how, mm -hmm. how do we kill giant, giant buck, my biggest velvet buck to date, maybe my biggest archery buck. But so we're just going to kind of walk through the process and show exactly what we did, where we were at, and go through it all. So I'll, I'm going to start off with Carson. The work started a couple months ago, looking for deer like these, and uh, this is a spot we usually find a lot of deer in. We don't know what the deer are going to be till we get out here for the year. And it so happened to be this year we had a, a really nice buck that we've been watching that's been coming out of some fields way down in the bottom of the valley and working his way all the way to the top. And he's been doing the same thing almost every day. This is why we came back to watch him, to try to catch him. Hopefully make our job a little easier if he keeps doing yeah. what he was doing. We need to pull out the onyx and see how far he actually traveled. So opening day, this is where we started. This is our vantage point. So we'll kind of walk you guys over here and show you where we're, where we're at. Uh, in the mornings, we tucked in on this this other side of the of these uh, the scrub oak, just because as the sun come, came up, we wanted to be in the shade. So we were on the shady side of it. We're on the sunny side of it now. Just kind of explain it. <coughs> But as Carson pointed out, those bucks were coming up out of the fields and then working their way across. Well, on the first morning, we had a buck come up right up underneath us. It kind of maybe caught our movement or something like that. And he ended up scraping around. And he was kind of, to me, he was kind of our first target buck. He was a shooter for sure, a little sticker. Um, but then just a, a few deer. So, but that's why, why we were here. He actually went to a spot and bedded where I felt like we could have killed him. Like yeah. It's in a really good spot. Yeah. Um, which you you said you that you hadn't seen them bed there before. No, typically. So when we've been watching them in the summer, they're on the ridge out here. There's some water up on top, and there's water down here in the bottom where we caught him the first morning where he came from. Uh, but usually they've been starting up high and then working all the way across and kind of through these alders right here. There's some cedars on the other side, which is where they were bedding. They would walk all the way across, cross this pipeline, and and head down into their beds. But this but this buck, the first buck we saw, who came from the water down low, he came out right here and then he bedded on that face, which we, yeah. which isn't surprising that he did, but it was surprising in the fact that we watched him do it because all summer we've been watching him cross. And so, like Tim said, it was he was in a killable spot. Yeah, like if, sure. if he would have stayed there, we would have got him. <laughs> but, so in the morning, prevailing wind is down valley. So this is a big, big long cut. So the prevailing wind here was down valley, so we didn't have to worry about him winning us. But as the day warmed up, like more towards the time frame we're at now, which is about eight or nine o'clock, then the thermals change and come this way. So that was my thought was we kind of spooked him and he was late enough that he laid there waiting for the thermals to change so that he could get the wind in his favor before he then moved into his second bed. And he stayed there for quite a while. I think it was one or two o'clock. We yeah. were getting ready to make a play on him. Um, and then a storm came in and pushed him out and he went up over the top and kind of ended that. Thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, we watched him for what, probably four hours or so. Yeah. We, we sat on him for a long time, just waiting for the, the right opportunity to move in. But that storm, he went to, to heavier cover, yeah. pushed him out of his spot. Well, what made you choose like this position in front of the, in this valley here or this ridge line than compared to like just down a little bit more where you can see them coming up earlier. The percentage of killing them over there is super low. And so there's not really a great vantage point other than across the canyon to see them coming up that way. Uh -huh. But if we're sitting here, if we see them come across and see them bed or see them make a move that we think we can get, on, get in on them, like we're in a spot that we can take advantage of what they do. So we're just setting ourselves up in the best position we can here. So depending on what they do, we're already in position to go make a move. Versus if we're watching them over there, we'll be in too tight, might bump them, or we're so far across the canyon, we won't have time to come all the way across to, mm -hmm. to look at him. We actually did that uh, the day, second day, day two, the evening. The evening of day two. two. And we'll kind of explain the reason why we did that and waited at that point. Because you guys also pointed out, like once we had this buck in his bed, you were like, why, why don't we go after him now, you know? Uh -huh. um, and I think it was reason was because it, we just wanted to see if, for one, if he was going to stay there. If he was going to, yeah, the whole time. Because we've never seen him bed there, so we didn't know if he was just staying there to hang tight for a minute and then get up and go to his actual bed, or, or if he really was going to stay there. So. Yeah. And we also have four or five days to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, so as it turns out, we were right. He did end up moving. I think it was more weather related. I think he would have been there all day and we would yeah. have probably killed that deer had that not happened. But So that was, that was day one. And this is kind of oh, our view. I think I think across, all the way across there was uh, just over a thousand yards over the top, so pretty tight, but not but plenty of room to, to have some movement. And then the evening of day two, uh, we'll pick up pick up over here. My question is the biggest key is to know where they're bed. That's like the number one. That's your number one thinking. Like when you're coming out here, is like okay, finding where they're gonna hunker down for the night or whatnot. So their bed is their safest spot. It's where they feel the safest. So if you can find that spot, then you then you start deciphering the weaknesses. What's weak about where he's bedding? Well, in this case, was we're going to show there was some landmark. There was some, you know, a place ways to approach. But it's like, what? Where's the wind going? The predominant wind going at this time? And because he might not have the same bed every time. He might have several yeah. beds that he's going to bed in, based on what that wind direction was or what the weather pattern was that day. Or you know what his mood was because the one night he was over way right. way over here. So if if you can find where he's going repeatedly, like you know, like you said, he's going there because he likes going there, mm -hmm. and so it's it's important to find that. And if you can watch him from afar and watch him keep doing that, and then you can piece together a game plan because you know he's going to end up there eventually. It may take different routes to get there, but you know he's going to be there. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of catching him or, or making the right move on him and, and having the stars line up. You have to pick pick apart his weaknesses because there's not very many. There's yeah. only going to be one or two. All the stars have to align for you to be able to kill a deer of age. You know? yeah, okay. Regardless of what he scores, a deer of age is a smart deer. Maybe. Okay. It's just putting all those pieces together. It's from, the hunt. From the end. Yeah, that's the yeah. hunt. Okay. The evening, we came right back here for the same thing to maybe see if something got into bed that we didn't see that morning, maybe something that went in early. And it was kind of a dead evening. I don't think we saw anything but a little two point. Huh? Yeah, we saw and we saw him come out of his bed and he went right back in his bed. Usually they'll feed out of their bed and they'll they'll come across his face. Like in the morning, they'll come across to their beds. Evenings they'll work all the way back and down. Oh. And they they didn't even work down to where we thought they were going. That deer we saw, like Tim said. I saw him for ten minutes about and the then storm front that came. That's why they were this big storm yeah. hit that night. Yep, it, yeah, a lot of lot of rain. Okay. A lot of rain. So they were they were staying in heavy cover. It was raining pretty hard, and I don't think they had any reason to move yeah. to stay out of the, the weather. The next morning, we came right back here, same plan. Did the exact same thing, um, nice and early. Uh, we didn't see squat. Nothing. <laughs> I don't think we saw a, oh, we saw the one doe. I oh, think, yeah. Maybe. Yep. Come nothing. across. Saw nothing, so nothing moved out of there. So what did that tell us? We need to go somewhere else. <laughs> we we need to see where they're going. Yeah. I think Carson was like, you know what? Let's let's skirt back around here and, and kind of glass down where they come from. Maybe they didn't make it. Maybe they just bedded right yeah. there. Yeah. So. Yeah. And when I say go somewhere else, not meaning abandon this area, meaning we know we want to hunt this place, but get a different vantage point to see if the deer are coming from a different angle, and, and we need to reposition because maybe for for this hunt we need to be somewhere else yeah. just because they were doing the same thing for the past month or so doesn't mean they'll they're gonna do it for a few days when we're here so yeah. just to relocate get different eyes different position and, and see what they're doing we're, we're here because this is the finishing zone you know you know this square mile was basically where he was going to be yeah and so that's that's why we're here this was the finishing area and so we wanted to start here instead of starting down there we'll take you on over to uh where we went down and had an encounter with a really really nice spot so yep let's go over there next I know you got really annoyed with uh, with us and stuff, but we were I was trying to go as slow as possible, man. I, like, and I know obviously camo, I didn't come with camo. I just came with an old OCP top. So I had no idea, but I mean, with camo, obviously it's, it's environmental, it changes. Your camo will change with the environment. But I mean, if you're camoed out, like even if you're in a ghillie suit, right? Like you have to stay put, like, I mean, if you're moving slowly and you're not making a sound, does, I mean, will that really alert the deer? They, they, I mean, they have like a sixth sense or something, right? They know? Yeah, it doesn't. In my opinion, I don't think it matters what you put on. If they see you moving, they're going to they're gonna peg you. Yeah. Like they, Why wouldn't they assume it's another animal? Or, or I mean, because there's other stuff out here. I mean, do they get just as alert with other animals too? And... Yeah, I think when, because when we're moving in on them, stalking in, like we're, we're in their bedroom. And 
and at that point they don't feel safe anymore. It doesn't matter what it is or who you are. If they see that movement kind of coming at them, they're, they're going to get up. And mm-hmm. Yep. Deer, deer will see movement more than they'll see. Like if we're if you're standing there in your day clothes, I mean they might recognize that something's there, but they're not really alert. But if you lift your arm or if you turn your head, then they're they're not on alert for sure. What's the movement and your and your smell and your scent mostly? So you gotta hunt them. But having having killer camo like that it sure helps, helps, doesn't it? It, it, it breaks <laughs> up breaks up your outline, helps you play yeah, a little bit. For sure. Sure. Step yeah. number one. And the military put a lot of research into those colors oh, yeah, and course, that pattern. So you, there was a lot of times where I looked back and you disappeared. You know? Really? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. When definitely. you were bedded, when you were bedded down in, in these little bushes right really? here, and all we saw was your little boonie hat in your camera. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, let's move over to uh, more uh, well, let's see evening, that, evening uh, of day two. Day two. Yeah, show you kind of advantage and, and walk you through kind of what we figured out there. I know. <laughs> Start picking these cedars apart. Yeah. Seeing what's underneath them. So this is where we came to. We actually parked back up here and worked down here. And as soon as we got here, I looked up and saw a doe underneath this tree here. And uh, hunker down. Carson to see those deer right there. And then I, I took my pack off and everything. And he pulled up his binoculars. He's like, "There's a good buck right here." So we we hunkered down right here in this brush and picked up some deer bedded on this cedar knob. Um, kind of down low, a couple of bucks just bedded. It was getting later in the morning. It was probably 10 or so. It was 10 or 10.30 and the wind at this point was now blowing out of the south, north. So it was where it was gonna be for the day. Yep. That's why we came to this side was to not blow out any of the area that we're hunting. Cause in our mind, this was a potential bedding area where they could be bedding. And then on the other side of this, see yeah. knob, another big spot where they would bed. There's always deer that, that bed in these cedars, and it's just, we didn't know if he was gonna be part of those deer that were there. And so when we came around, we were able to pick that one buck up right there. And as Tim said, the wind was, was coming down. So our game plan was to come all the way back around and hit this two track that cuts right underneath right here. And we were gonna follow that two track all the way down and then cut back underneath. So we had the wind in our favor to to yeah. give ourself a, this, a chance. This was a nice buck. He was a nice four by four. Wasn't the one we were deer. after, but he was he was one that he was worth going after. We left uh, Mike and Donnie here to film from this side. We went around and parked up high in the trees and walked on down through and just kept, kept elevation. We tried to cross at the same elevation as where the buck was bedded when we had last seen him, but we didn't even make it in very far before I saw him slinking up through out of the trees. These guys said he got up out of his bed and worked around. So Carson and I just kind of backed out and just just basically still hunted through through the trees there and um, bumped another little buck. And at one point we got in there and had to back out to around. But all the whole time we had the wind in our favor. We were always playing the wind. But at that point, not having the visual and knowing for a fact he wasn't in his bed, it all of a sudden became a totally different game. Yeah. It was a spot and stop game, which was which is super fun, but really low low odds of success the plan we had radios and we were gonna we'll have have you guys walk us in on the deer but of course when i got over there the the radios weren't working yeah. and so when we got there and realized he wasn't in his bed i glassed back to you guys sitting on the knob and i see was it donnie that he gave me one of these because <laughs> I, I was looking at him in the binos i'm like where is he at and he's he's like this so i was like okay we're gonna give her one of these up here <laughs> and so in my mind he was up and to the right 
and so I don't know how far or how close he was and so we backed out and went up and to the right and there he was. <laughs> was we're just slinking through and I picked him up in his bed um, he was following me obviously because I was had an arrow knocked ready to go just I picked him up in his bed staring straight at us so at that point I know we're had but we're we're probably 40 yards from there yeah. and you're either had or you're had there's out there was no shot so I was like, all right, well, will you just trust in your camo, trust that he's going to hold tight, that maybe he thinks that you didn't see him. And I worked around the brush and was able to step around closer and uh, come to full draw and step out behind the brush and hold on him. And he stood up out of his bed and I had a, I had a, a shot, but not a perfect shot. Like there was his vitals were covered. I could have put it in the last last couple of ribs or a little far forward. Both would have been extremely lethal shots at 30 yards. And uh, stood there for a minute, and you know it just didn't click. There's the switch didn't go off. Um, so I let down, and he and he and he kind of kind of went off, and that was it. But it was like a really awesome experience. We yeah. won. We knew that we knew that we we had him if we wanted. But like like uh, Cheeto said, he said sometimes you know a good home hunter will back out, tip his hat, say thank you, and move on to the next one. Are you looking for the same deer? You you're trying to track or you're trying to get on the same buck that you want, right? Like from originally, like what we yeah. saw when we saw him? We, we wanted to, I mean, wouldn't it have been great if we picked him up in his bed, the yeah. giant in his bed? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we always we always knew giant was number one, but finding him, like in the back of my mind, I'm like, ah, eh, like it's gonna be really lucky if we find him, but we're looking for him, but mm -hmm. I, I wasn't expecting to find him here, okay. even though he could have gone this way. Cause yeah. he's he's going to his bed to where we've seen him. Right. But it's a matter he could be going on the backside. He he could be coming here. So we were just coming here just to to cover our bases and to make sure he wasn't here. Okay. I don't have any questions, but I think this was out of all of the hunt. This was one of my favorite parts being in here because Donnie and I were just hunkered down, and I was we were talking about deployments and our, we were talking about Afghanistan or what were we talking about Afghanistan uh, Iraq or something like that and it's just like <laughs> it's I told him I said I feel like we're on ambush you know we're just uh, <laughs> sitting yeah. in the brush we're watching these guys we're surveilling them it was just it was kind of sci-fi like and I, I really liked that it was my, one of my favorite parts about it was cool. definitely cool to be a part of it you know like the, with the hand the hand signals was like really cool <laughs> yeah. I was like part of it I was, I went, <laughs> we hand went, up yeah. hand up and I'm like yeah <laughs> Like I knew what I was doing, <laughs> and, he, and you guys did exactly what happened. Yeah, it's so funny. it just it felt it felt cool to be a part of it for sure, yeah, a, a part of the kill, unkill, and essentially, yeah. you know, because yeah, you wound up, and you're like, oh shit, he's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna get him, and back down. Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was really awesome. Cool. I'm glad that you guys were able to. Uh, see us from down there because I was waving my hand like this yeah. and I was like I wonder if he's gonna see me and I'm looking through the glass and he's like oh he waves back <laughs> was it pretty easy to spot us up here yeah we, we knew where you were right right but like where you were sat down hunkered down you weren't skyline you were tucked in so they oh, they cool. wouldn't have been able to pick you up but because I knew where you were at you could find you and find us. So, that was fun that was so much fun when the buck moves position I mean that will all I mean from up here if we did what you were going to do, right? Like yeah. you set up glass and you you spot your deer and then you make your maneuver around and try hunt, hunting him. And obviously I'm sure this happens a lot where he gets up and he moves to a different spot. So you just like take me through that process like of how and why like you chose what you did and you found him. Yeah, so like in a perfect scenario, um, he stays in his bed we know where he's at we have the wind in our advantage we have a, a destination we've got on our on our on x of where he's at where we want to get to we, we've seen a visual of it here a lot of times like we did on the kill day we'll take a picture of the terrain so that as we're working through we have reference to and like okay well this is this landmark where we're at or on your on x you can kind of point in the direction of where you need to be which is super handy but ideally they stay there because then then he's dead um, in but this if case, he moves, he if I mean, like you did, he moves, and you, you kind of you pick up yeah. on him. But often, some, I'm sure they get away sometimes, like, or yeah. you just like miss them, 
and you walk past them and you're like, oh shit, like I, we didn't see him obviously. He just moved off. So in our case, I saw him. So in this, in this specific case, I saw him, so I knew he was on his feet. And so we were able to make a con conscious decision to stay above and, and go after him. Okay. If we had gotten, and, and we had you guys up here to tell us, he, you know, won't give us one of these. <laughs> yeah. If you don't have a spotter, which I never have spotters, right. it's a totally different game. If you don't have a spotter and you don't see him, you get to the bed and you're like, well, crap, where'd he go? Well, he's bedded 40 yards above you. You have no clue. Yeah, no So idea. you back out and you're done. Your hunt's over. So this is one of those cases where solo hunting sucks. Right. But if you have a team or some guys with you, even even one person with you, yeah. to have that extra set of eyes, it, it will make you 100 times more successful, way yeah. more successful. Um, and that's why guys that consistently kill kill great animals, you know, older class animals, they have a t they have somebody with them usually. You know. okay. Solo hunting is a totally different ball game. Totally different. Patience kills. And then we'll take you over where we went that evening. So at that point, we knew that they weren't over there. We, we hadn't seen them. We had worked our deer here, so we knew he wasn't here. Um, so we made an evening, a plan for the evening to actually go even farther away from our final destination where we wanted to kill him. So we're kind of moving farther, farther away from the kill zone, you know, from the final zone. Yeah, just just trying to cover as much ground as we possibly can to try to turn him up. You can hunt in the state park, you just can't kill them in the state park. <laughs> Like step one. This right. is step yeah, one. Step what lives here? Th this is what where we lives here. First of June. This is where we come. Right. We okay. come just to see what's here, because we know they're they do it every year. Okay. And so we know generally what they're gonna do. It's just a matter of finding what caliber of bucks are doing. It's like several years ago, they killed a, the giant stag buck. Yeah, he was, here he was over here. That's okay. what he did. Yep. But so you you take inventory, and then you compartmentalize what's here. And then you strategize of what are they doing consistently over time. Yeah. And when you start in June and it's now August, you know, you've got a pretty good idea of what what these specific deer are doing. Okay. So as Tim was saying, we were over there on that knob looking down on that, that cedar point. Uh, didn't find him over there, so we came all the way back across the canyon to look across because also, during the summer, we've been seeing him in that really, really thick scrub oak alder In between drop. the red and the, and the yep, cedar knob. In between the cedar knob and that, that red clay ridge right there. And looking at it from here, there is, there is no vantage point or really opportunity to, to get on him right there just because it's so thick. And this is the only place to really see that from. And so we decided to come over here just to see if we could lay eyes on him. And, and sure enough, evening of day two, we catch him bedded on that hillside. And we're watching him for a little while and he gets up and he starts moving down the hill. So not Quickly. only is he across a canyon and in a, a draw that we can't get to, he's, he's moving the wrong way, which was expected. That's, that's what they've been doing. They've been working down this, this canyon, this draw, working down into these fields. And in the mornings, they'll go all the way back up over and across. And you can see the pipeline of where we were on the first day. So we were set up to where he was going to be. And that's where they end up. They cross that pipeline and bed in the cedars to the left of the pipeline over there. And so we were we were waiting for him to come, come out of there. And the last couple of days, I think he'd been holding up tight with those storms, staying in the really thick cover. And so we knew he was there. It's just a matter of catching him where he was going to be. So that was that was our our thinking of a coma here. Let's locate him, and let's let's see what he's going to do. They're traveling between that distance where we got him, into here, and is that like the normal distance that they'll travel between days? Uh, for those deer, yeah, I think it really depends on the deer and where yeah. you're bedding. It could some deer go 100 yards and these deer go mile and a half two miles yeah. all right we'll move back move back over to uh morning of day three back to where we started oh, 
that's not in my pocket. Mail. <laughs> Mail deer. Mail deer. Proof. Party, party attack. I didn't want to litter, so I put a little notches in my pocket. Alright, so we're back up here. So the third morning, we were right back to where we were the first morning, first two mornings. Yeah. We're just slightly above that, a little higher elevation, um, just so we can see a little bit more. But how we ended up here was we started there. We saw several bucks cross, just nothing we were after, just all the young young bucks. And uh, we were there until about nine or ten o'clock, and then we went just went just just for a look about, you know, driving around to see what we could see, because the winds were winds were up pretty high. At that it, point. it was the there was a big storm coming in, and the winds they were ripping. It was super windy, so not ideal conditions to start start out the day. We actually went back over to the oil, oil pad where we were, where we just were just now. And then I thought, I was thinking we were done because it was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I was like, you yeah, know, I guess, guess today's kind of a blow. We'll just go back and get some food and whatever. And for some reason, I don't know what you, why you wanted to come out this way, <laughs> come up here. Probably intuition, huh? Yeah, I just, I just figured it's another vantage point we haven't been at and we can see more country different angle of where he's been bedding at. And I figured if if we're gonna try it, let's try it today. We haven't seen much, so can't hurt anything if we come up no. here. So, and luck, luckily enough, I'm glad we decided to come up here because straight across, sure enough, there he was bedded with those seven, six or seven bucks that we saw this morning cross. And I don't know if he stayed there or he crossed in the probably in the morning. He could have come across, like I say, that low point there too. Yeah, where right we down the bottom. Couldn't they, have seen him. They crossed over and then dipped down in, and then we didn't see him go all the way across. So he may have just hit that low spot. Yeah, he could have been right underneath our nose. But I looked over here and all I saw was red bodies. I was like, oh man, there's all those little bucks, and you're like, I think I found our buck. <laughs> I was setting up my spot and scope, and I think I found our buck. Yep. Sure enough, you look up and there's that gray body and then with just this giant no How push. long was it to when you parked and then when you saw the buck? Oh, yeah, we, we found him quick. We found him really quick because they were bedded on that, that white red clay and so they're, they're pretty easy to pick out when they're laying in that mm -hmm. stuff. And so as soon as we threw our binos up, we were able to pick them out of their beds. I was like, Oh yeah, that's him. <laughs> Where's my spot and scope? <laughs> you know, it was pretty exciting at that point. And then all of a sudden the wheels start turning. That's when all the, the pieces of the puzzle start coming together. What do we need to do to, yeah. to kill this deer? First thing I went to was uh, the wind is hard in our favor, hard, which is great for stalking because it covers your noise and just the scent is consistent, we knew it. And the second thing I picked out as I looked, as I looked across there, was uh, that dead cedar, that upside down cedar right yep. above him, 20 yards yep. above him. It's like, well, there's a landmark you don't have every day. Mm -hmm. And then I think Carson picked out the rocks up at the top above the cedar that we could get to from the, from the pipeline. So it was just, at that point it was pulling out your Onyx, which I'm glad he had his, he had service. I didn't have service and I didn't cache my maps, but he was able to pull out Onyx and mark where the buck was, mark, where we wanted to get to, which was that pile of rocks essentially, because then from there we knew we could see, you know, get a good vantage of where he was in his bed and uh, where we wanted to park. So that was that was key, super. Yeah, hard. so I, I pulled out my Onyx map and this red blue dot is where we are. And this red dot is where the deer is. And so this was just another vantage point piece of the puzzle from when we got over there, we knew we needed to get to right here. Because a lot of times, I don't know about you, Tim, when we get in there, stuff looks a lot different. Well, we almost then, ended up on this other ridge. Yeah, we almost ended up over here. In fact, we were over here, and we then I pulled out my onyx, and I'm like, hold on, we need to go back over here. Dude, and canyon, and so we looped all the way back around and came back on top. And then because of this pin, then we're able to find, okay, here's the rocks, there's a cedar, and then we know underneath that cedar, there's our deer. And the onyx when you got out of the truck and you're using the GPS, and you're kind of following that around your, the hill to meet your point? Yeah, we so we, we dropped a pin right here where we're at, where that deer was, and then we started making our move. Then when we got to where 
we thought we were close, then we pulled it out and said, okay, are, are we in the right spot? Do we need to start getting serious? The other thing we both did was I noticed I didn't, we didn't even talk about it, but I noticed you were doing it. I was, as I'm taking a picture, I look you over and you're taking a picture. Like we were taking a picture on our phones of the topography and then in, in, in the event that your maps maybe don't load, maybe he doesn't have service right. over there or whatever else. Yeah. So we have this visual image of this is where we're at. And I remember the Aspens up at the top that I took the picture of way at the very high because that was kind of where I started to get a little disoriented was mm -hmm. at those high Aspens. Yeah. That's why I looked at my picture one time. I was like, oh, we're way high. So, yeah. So all those little things that you can do to give yourself advantage. When you're by yourself, it's essential. You, you couldn't, totally. it'd be impossible to do a stock like that by yourself without having those tools that on X we're taking a picture. Even with both of us, it took us a minute. Yeah. To, if you were to watch us from here, we were probably going <laughs> all over the place. You're like, where are these guys going? Where are they? But you know, from here, it looks like you just, it's a straight shot to, to where he's bedded. But when you get over there, things look a lot different. A deer lays in his bed till dark, he's still alive. That deer stands up, walks to the left, he's still alive. That yep. deer stands up, winds us, runs out, he's still alive. Like there's all these things. If that wind swirls because of the storm front, a lot of times that'll happen. Storm yeah, it'll, front. yeah. The six or seven other deer bedded with you catch us. We're so lucky yeah. that they were all. Did you? I, at one time, we'll talk about that when we get up there. At okay. one time, I went a direction and I was 19 yards from that <laughs> You know, I, I was like, oh. Man. Yeah, I see Tim walk around this tree and then he stops. And I'm like, this is either really good or really bad. And I start seeing him backpedal. I said, uh, maybe not the best. <laughs> I'm just praying that deer didn't see him. As yeah. soon as he come back, I was like, did he see you? He's like, no, he's good. He's, but I knew which buck was. He was looking was, the so other like way. Exactly yep. at that point yep. where yep. our so we did our our homework here we tried to find every deer bedded over there we just didn't find him and go we made sure we could we could pinpoint each deer that was bedded with him six, you spot here? six plus him was yeah so okay. seven counting him yeah, and he was the gray one so there's no mistake yeah yeah cool so that's what we did here then we left these guys here and we boogied around and got up on top so we'll take you up there now walk you down into the beds just kind of show you the cluster that we had up there it's kind of fun Yeah, this is where we parked here and we knew he was he was down off in the cedars and so we started working our way down and we'll take you down to where we started to get serious. Yeah, we had the wind perfect, loud wind in our face, but yep. this is where up, up above that we showed you from there. So Carson's just gonna walk us in and kind of get us to the point of taking the boots off. So I think yep. we were right here, right? The first time, just above, I think. Yeah, right over here, and then we're like, "Hold on, we gotta, we gotta circle back." Yeah, there's that alder patch that threw me off right there. Yeah, still up pretty high. Watch us find the other shooter, Bucky. <laughs> Walk right up on him. Well, if we do, we probably ought to back out. Yeah, I guess da damage is already done. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep going. Well, there's that little, there's that little right buck. Oh, yeah, I think we need to go here. But yeah, my, we do. This is where we were first. We oh, yeah, you're right. My, right my right onyx here. is saying this. Yeah. yeah. So we came on. Yeah. Yep. You're right. <laughs> For a minute while it's raining. This is the kind of rain that will get you wet. This is the rain that will get you wet. Oh man. <laughs> How long is this gonna last? <laughs> These are the rocks. This is kind of the rock outcropping that we saw from the other side. Looks quite a bit different from up here than what you'd expect it to be. Yeah. But this is where we knew we wanted to get. As we looked over, we kind of snuck over here. And this is where we could pick up this dead cedar, you know, this upside down cedar. So at this point, now we know we're, we're in the zone, we're in 60 yards. But this is where you get an idea of how steep it is too and kind of what you're up against. So we spent we spent several minutes here looking for, for one, glassing, making sure we couldn't pick up any deer that were looking back at us, but also just kind of pick the terrain. 
And right here, it was kind of, it kind of hit me that with this crown in the hill, that the odds of us getting an angle of a shot was gonna be tough, but we, we kind of figured we'd have to work around this direction, so. Right here's where we slipped off our boots. I think we tucked our boots back in over here and uh, decided to get silent. You know, the ground was still pretty soft from the, the day prior rains. Um, we could have probably got away with it with the, the amount of wind that we had and, the, and how soft the ground was. But on a deer of this caliber, I was like, I think I looked at Carson, I was like, I'm not taking any chances. I'll walk a mile barefoot for this deer. So we tucked our boots right here. Right here, I went ahead and knocked an arrow just in case they got up and feed, were feeding. I knew that they hadn't hadn't winded us or anything, but we just kind of, I'll just kind of take you through our steps and the process of what was going on in our heads. But we, we literally were probably moving at this pace, you know, it was kind of just a move and a crawl and a move and a crawl. And there was times when like here, there's this bench in front of us. We know there's no eyes on us. So I think we, you can see where we were stepping here. I think we mm -hmm. moved a little quicker through here. But this whole time, I'm looking for a shooting lane. I'm looking, can I see him in his bed? Cause there's, there's the cedar right here, the burnt cedar. So I know he's down here. And right here I was like, crap, there's another ledge. Yeah. You know, I can't like, see was it right ledge. here that, that you moved across and you found that little buck? I did, that... I did some of this kind of thing looking yeah and i thought dang if we could get down there but that was too low down back there was too low so right here yeah. you're right this is where like we backtracked yep right around this tree is where tim popped over and we found one of the, the smaller bedded bucks with him so this this stuff is awesome to sneak in it's super quiet but if this happens you know a rock rolls you're, you're hosed so I got, you can see my back pedal right here. Yeah. <laughs> like I got to right here and I looked in that bed right just below that cedar, just to the left of these. And that buck was in his bed right there. And so that's when I back pedaled away, which fortunately super quiet ground to work with. Um, wind just hammering. So we went back to starting point here. And this is when the wheels start turning like crud. What do we, what do you do? And at this point here, Carson pointed out this little trail right here, just barely below us. Cause I was thinking even going farther. So we backed over to here. And this is where once we hit this pebbles, I was like, oh, this is where having your boots off was was kind of important because these these things roll like crazy so we were able to sneak through pretty quiet without rolling any rocks i didn't hear you roll a single rock mm -hmm. i think we were even lower were we lower oh well, yeah because right here see my path oh yeah path? right here because you're right here it was and i was right here So had we picked, had I picked my binoculars up here, I may have seen him, which it's kind of probably a good thing I didn't because I may not have got, Wouldn't a, have got a as shot. aggressive. So I got to right here. I think I remember looking through here and caught his antlers moving. And so then I was able to get to here. And this is where I was for the next hour, hour and a half was right here. This is, my, this is where I was standing. He was tucked in right there. All I could see was, basically I could see the tips of his ears and the top of his rack just sitting in his bed right there. And I was able to get out my rangefinder and range that cedar tree at 30 yards exactly. So he was sitting at 29 yards, 28 yards, just this side. There's absolutely no, knowing that his buddy's bedded below him from what we saw across, there was no way to get a shot in. So I, I remember look, turning and looking at Carson, I was kind of dejected. I was like, we gotta wait. Yep. We have to wait him out. And Carson was just like, okay. And he sat right where he's standing right now. Yeah, I just hunkered down. Sat down and I just stayed out of Tim's way. So this said, is where we were for a while. Here we were. Um, 
after like 40 minutes, I told Carson I was kind of sick of it, so I picked up a rock and boom, flung it over there. Farther, I mean, I had quite the arm, really <laughs> a lot of adrenaline. That, that rock went way over there. Uncle Rico. He, as soon as the rock hit, his head went to us, or to this direction, and then back. And the reason they do that is because he, he knows he's got his escape route. He's just checking one more time to make sure that his escape route is clear because he heard the noise over there. So he's, he, he immediately in his mind processed where he was gonna go and then immediately went to where the noise came from. I was hoping he would just stand up, which he didn't. He laid there for a while. Probably another 30 minutes. At least 30 minutes. After the rock, yeah. Then, you know, I was hoping that they would clear and the sun would come out. That was my thought. The sun would come out and he'd get up out of his bed and reposition. But I think that, would have, that wouldn't have helped us. That would have hurt us because he would have tucked in tighter. Yep. So as, as luck had it, again, one of those lucky things, the storm front came in and the rain, and I could see him just blinking his eyes and the wind was just pushing the rain right in his face and he was not liking that at all. And that's at the point where I knew he was gonna stand up. And I saw his head go back like they do to rock and then you know, his head goes down, his ass came up and he stood up. And as he stood up, I drew back right here. You can see on the video. And I had one little lane that I had studied that I had about eight inches that if his vitals were right there, I could kill him. And he stood up and his vitals were right there. But I needed, I needed three or four more inches of depth. I, I could have hit him mid body, but if I was low at all, it would have hit brush and, and ended up bad. So I was, just was patient. You can see me kind of, I take one step back up here to try to get a little more elevation. And it just, it was probably enough, but not enough to make me 100% confident. And then, he had one of two ways to go, left or right. And he came right, and as he came right, I think at this point I was has had, had held for 45 seconds or so. It was about 50 seconds that I'd held. He fed, he came out, came straight towards us, and I remember now why he looked because I did this to get the clear shot, and that's why he looked. And Carson kind of bent around the mountain, but he was right there. At that point, it was 24 yards because I had ranged that brush right there at 26 and he was just above it. That's where we hit him. Ran off this way and did his thing, but everything had to come together. All the pieces had to fall into place. Just the luck, 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 luck. And then a little bit of skill had to happen. That was it. After the bro hugs and celebration was done, then, uh, we went down to gather up these guys, but for now, Carson's going up to get, take a side-by-side -side around and come in so that we don't have to hike back up because we're going to finish down at the bottom of the valley. We'll just come down and check out where he was bedded, and I'll kind of, we'll, when Carson gets back, we'll kind of go over and talk about why why we feel like he was bedded the way he was. Oops. The other thought that crossed my mind was potentially getting over to here. I kind of want to see what it looks like. Yeah, I'll let me get my phone out. But I, I still wouldn't have had a shot at him from here because I thought maybe if I got to here, but there was no shot. There's no shot from here. No, nothing. If he was in that bed, there's no shot. So we we actually went down back over here. When you know, when you shot him, and you let go. You knew you hit him, yeah. I could see exactly where I hit him. Yeah. And from experience, he was super lethal, but then he when he ran out. Because he took off, like, right yeah. away. What's running through your mind when you released? I had, I mean, I was drawn for 50 seconds. Yeah. You know, I had all this time to level my bubble and do everything that a, that a guy needed to do to calm himself down. And we were standing there for over an hour. So everything was calm and rehearsed. Like I had played out of my mind a dozen times him doing exactly what he did, walking out. I played out of my mind, what so do I do if he turned that. left? It was him, I visualized it already. Okay. I had seen that shot happen already you, before Do you feel like that's crucial? It is, you have to, it's just like a free throw or anything else, a golf shot, you have to have that pre-shot routine and that visualization. And that's exactly, I mean, I played out every scenario. What if he stands up and I have a shot, kill him. 
What if he stands up and he turns around and tucks in? Sit down and be patient. What if he stands up and bolts? You're mm -hmm. screwed. What if he stands up and feeds to the right? Sucker's dead, okay. know, 23 yards. Okay. But there's all those pieces that you look at and say, what does the arrow look like? What does the blood look like? What, how did he react after the hit, after the impact? And you have all those things that you process to determine the end result. In this case, it was it was it was obvious, very obvious. And that's something you practice, you do, and experience yeah. over and over. Every hunt, even if I missed him, I'm walking through this. And what happened? Where did he go? That's why when we kind of played out with you guys, we want to find out where he went. Okay. Know? We would have done the same thing had we bolted him. Mm -hmm. I would want to know exactly where he went. We probably would have tracked him for a while to see where his next safety zone is. Oh, there's a lot more. Uh, uh, yeah, just knowledge and being very careful and you have so many like variables mm -hmm. like you say practice to be able to do that you know you don't necessarily unless if as the hunter you have to think your way through it and process it as a as a as a producer you know or someone that's observing yeah you're supposed to just follow what follow his lead oh, yeah. but there's still you have to be super quiet you know you have to be able to tuck in um, understand each other's cues, just all those things. But Tim's working his way over to where he was bedded, but at where he was, this deer bedded, he was he was in his bedroom. He was where he felt safest. And by where we were, we could only see the top of his antlers because he was tucked right underneath that tree, butted right up against the hill with the wind coming right at him. So the, when they bed, they, they put a lot of thought and effort in to where they want to go because that's where they feel safest and it just so happened to be because we had the wind in our favor with that storm pushing in we were able to work our way down and then couldn't get any closer so we we sat and waited on him and we'll we'll walk over here and show you his exact bed he was in and the way he was positioned and sort of why why they like bend the way they do so this this is where he was laying you know so he's got a great great view of the valley but if, if you're at his eye level, which is slightly lower than my eye level here, you know, it's really difficult to pick him out from the bottom if you're glassing from the bottom because of all this ama amount of brush and the way the hillside rolls from here. But it affords him the ability to have the wind in his face and his ears are pinned back. So he's listening for above, you know, listening for rocks rolling or any, any danger from there. But he was still facing that way and then there were some other bucks bedded below and I think they had moved up over here. But, but and he was right here from my view. So I had an angle through this brush, which I'm really glad I didn't have to shoot through this brush. Um, but when the time came, the wind was just pounding in his face. The rain was hitting him in his face. And he got up and he went right through here and got to this point. And this is where I knew I was, this is where I knew he was gonna kill him. And he started to angle up towards this direction towards us. And I think he got, this is, this is where he lunged to, yeah, right there. Took down through here. So I think he got about right here. And that's when I crouched down and he looked and Carson peeked around. And I just come right there, just zipped him. And that's where he lunged here. And then we have blood already, you know. He did one more lunge here. Arrow was, was, was right here as it, so it's as the energy of the arrow passing through his speed it didn't fall out until here, you know? Especially in a case where you hit him and you don't know, you didn't see him go down. Then you want to find that arrow and investigate, see what happened. See Let's what's just, on the arrow. I'll usually find it before I find, go tracking blood. That gives me time to settle down and relax and give the animal the time to expire if he has to. In this case, was, like I said, we said before, it was obvious. But he bounded down through here and did his whole switchback thing, just like you saw on the, on the video, you know? Um, and we walked you guys through, we'll just kind of patch that into this, this whole project. We kind of walked these guys as new hunters through what we're looking for on the blood trail mm -hmm. of how it all fell, fell into place. But uh, it's kind of neat to, to reenact it from his view and see what he saw, you know. It's always fun to, to be a part of hunts like this. I've been, I mean, I've haven't been hunting as long as Tim. He's a little long in the tooth. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of longer. He, but I've been, now ever since I could walk, I've been, been hunting deer, but it's 
hunting deer like this is something special. Like you, even though I've been doing it pretty much my whole life and I'm still gonna continue to learn. Like I learned a lot of new things about deer and, and hunting this specific deer, old deer smart. So it's just, even though I do it every week, it's still just as fun or funner when you hunt hunt deer like this, so. Killing deer is easy, killing big deer. Yeah. Killing a specific deer is difficult. You hunt one deer, it's a different game. Yeah, fun. It's so fun. fun. That's why we do it. I didn't realize he came. Okay, so here's where he turned around right here. Yeah. <laughs> God, he smells like shit. Yeah. Yeah, boy. Team effort. <laughs> Congrats, man. Hey boys, this is a giant. Yeah. Look how freaking heavy. Yeah. He carries his mask. He's gonna scare us. He's gonna scare us. Why do they smell like shit? <laughs> Welcome, dear. Jesus. Oh, God, this buck's a toad. Your heart is all bladed. Oh, That's where yeah. it's at. Getting it done, huh? Oh, good. Good grief. Oh, this is one you were watching. First blood is needed. Good job, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Look at this. Yeah, watch me. Watch me. Watch me. Uh, <laughs> 